And let's pray together. Father in heaven, I'm so thankful for uh, the little procession that we see uh, on Sunday mornings that there are children in this building learning about Jesus and uh, learning to trust Him. And Father, there's a, a certain tenderness and openness to the Gospel that uh, seems like it, it hardens with age. And so I pray that You would uh, meet them this morning and that the truths that are, are simple enough to a stick in a child's heart would do that. I thank you for the people who lead back there, uh, Wendy and others who uh, are teaching them and just ask for your blessing on that ministry. Father, I thank you for this time when we can gather and, and look uh, into your word, hopefully in, in somewhat of a deep way and grow in our understanding and learn from you. Father, I thank you for the truths that we confessed in song together. Uh, you, an eternal God, always uh, truthful, always trustworthy, never failing, never uh, abandoning your people. And I think some, sometimes we miss how that is tied to your love. Uh, the Bible from beginning to end talks about, in the Old Testament, the hesed, the uh, covenant faithfulness or love, the mercy of God, and how it drives who he is and what he does for people. And then, of course, uh, the most beautiful expression of God's love, the living image of your love, Jesus Christ. And so I pray that uh, we'd see glimpses of that today. I ask that um, I'm coming relying uh, on your word and your Holy Spirit uh, to do the work uh, of proclamation this morning and ask that uh, each person would receive what they ought, whether that's encouragement or correction. Uh, but I pray that you would go beyond human words and do uh, what I cannot. And uh, thank you for this time, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, maybe 10 feet below me, I mean it, almost exactly below where I'm standing, uh, is an office dedicated to the extraction of what is rotten, crooked, twisted, or flawed. Uh, their work is often painful and disconcerting. Sue and I have been uh, victims down there recently. Um, and uh, sometimes temporarily disfiguring. We don't often think of dentists as lifesavers, uh, but I actually knew a young father back in Illinois who uh, didn't take care of his dental work. The ensuing infection uh, caused a systemic infection, and he, he actually died from not taking care of his teeth. So, uh, it, it's hard to imagine that a few bad teeth could destroy a body. But, that is the realization that, act, that led to dentistry in the first place. It's been taking place since uh, uh, Egypt. And even within the last 150 years, dentistry was most about, mostly about extraction. Taking out uh, what could cause problems. So, from ancient times right up to relatively recent. Now, can you imagine what kind of business they'd get downstairs if that's all they advertised for? We're just going to remove things and leave you ugly. It wouldn't be a pretty picture. And I've witnessed uh, something that isn't beautiful either. And that's people trying to live the Christian life simply by extraction or subtraction. Uh, people who have claimed, have come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior, but they, divine, they define their life, their faith, primarily by what they've removed. What they don't do. Uh, my grandmother was a, a really solid Baptist, old school lady born in the 1800s, and she used to smile at me and say, John, don't smoke, don't chew, don't drink, don't go with the girls that do. Uh, and, and that's how... <laughs> That's how some people define their faith. Uh, and God's Word undeniably contains a lot of don'ts for us. We have the thou shalt nots in the Old Testament, but the New Testament, the new, the new covenant of Jesus Christ, also talks extensively, has long lists of things that should be extracted from the, the true Christian life. Next week in chapter 5, we'll read... But among you, 
among believers, there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity or of greed because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking which are out of place. So, uh, you know, you just pick up on these words. Uh, there, they shouldn't be, there shouldn't be even a hint. They're improper. They're out of place for God's holy people. So it's not wrong to think about your life in terms of, hey, there are some things that need to be removed. There are some rotten things in my life, some cracked things, some twisted, some flawed, and I need to be putting those off. That's not all wrong, but it's only half right. It's only half of the truth. The injunctions to remove are there for multiple reasons. Uh, it, it's good for you <laughs> to get some of these things out of your life that we'll talk about. But the primary reason in what we've been reading in Ephesians chapter 4, uh, has the, the chapter is about the unity and health of the Christian body. Of, of a church. And last week we saw that we need each other's holiness. In other words, we need to each be following Christ, and that increases how we follow Christ together. Otherwise, the body is not going to mature and be whole like it should. So the Holy Spirit spoke to the church through Paul. He speaks today to us about removing behaviors that are damaging for the growth, the unity, the health of the body of Christ. But subtraction is only half of the truth of holiness. The pattern in the New Testament instruction is always removal and replacement. It's getting rid of certain things and, and bringing new things in. Replacement. Taking off in order to put on. Jesus isn't just concerned about rooting out disease in his body. He wants to create a healthy, uh, attractive uh, group full of useful lives. Our main text today, I already mentioned, is in Ephesians 4. And the, the, what we're going to be spending most of our time in is 25 to 32. But I'm going to start reading in 22 uh, just to, to pick up. You'll hear this idea of taking off and putting on. So Ephesians 4.22 You were taught with, your, with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your mind and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor. For we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. He who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with his hands that he may have something to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as Christ, just as in Christ, God forgave you. So I hope you heard a little bit of it there. We're going to point it out in more detail. But the Christian life is not just about subtraction. It's a life of proactivity. It's not just about rooting out the rotten. It's about replacing it with that which is wholesome, healthy, and constructive. So I want to summarize uh, the passage with this in mind. I'm just going to briefly Mark out the points and then we'll look at them in more detail. It's not enough to silence the lie. We must also speak truth to one another in love. It's not enough to contain our anger. We have to deal with it. It's not enough to stop stealing. We must live responsible, generous, other-oriented lives. It's not 
enough to, dist- uh, to silence destructive speech. We are responsible to verbally build each other up. It's not about a new set of rules. It's about a new relationship with others because we have a new relationship with God. So now we'll take them apart. Uh, in the context of the body of Christ, because that's where Paul is speaking to. And it's very plain, that's very plainly, I think, very plain in verse 25, that that's the context. He says, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor. So that's, you've got to speak truth to everybody. But then he narrows it down and he says, for we are all members of one body. That's his way of talking about the local church, all those who believe in Jesus Christ. So speak truth to everybody, but especially to your brothers and sisters in Christ. He's describing, so first of all, how we have to relate as believers, people who are all members of one body. In light of this new life that we have in Christ, a new person that we're supposed to be putting on, Uh, the fact that we are being recreated to be like God. Did you catch that in the text? We're we're supposed to be like God. Another way to put it is we're supposed to be uh, having the image of Christ Jesus formed in our lives. So we have to put off falsehood because of all of this. Why would falsehood be harmful to the body of Christ? What if the the physical parts of your body were lying to each other? Uh, That happens, doesn't it? Uh, I had a really severe back injury that hit in my 30s, really started to complicate life in in my 30s, and I didn't get signals up my leg as fast as, of my left leg as fast as my right leg. So it would often cause me to trip a curb or lifting my foot uh, to go up steps until I got that fixed. So, sometimes our body doesn't cooperate, doesn't send the right signals. Uh, you know, most of us could eat a teaspoon, teaspoon of sugar without any problem. But not if your pancreas isn't working right. It, it reads that teaspoon of sugar and says, oh, I've got to dump all kinds of insulin into the body. It gets a, a bad message and it can kill you. So, we can have wrong messages going on in the physical body. We can have... Uh, wrong messages going on in a spiritual body, and, and both will be to bad effect. Uh, falsehood can produce overblown responses in the body of Christ also. In fact, the first church that I served, I had just been invited onto the staff. I had no idea there, was any pro- there were any problems. But all of a sudden, people started resigning. Different, uh, the music director and then this the, the guy that was in charge of maintenance, he resigned and his family was big in the church. And then finally it led to the resignation of the senior pastor. And there was a lot of information that had led to that point. But boy, after, you know, after the senior pastor left, it just like got exponentially worse. And people who didn't know what was going on just decided to fill in the blanks and say, well, this is why they're doing what they're doing, or this is why they made that decision. And it wasn't uncommon to hear four or five different versions of why whatever was happening. And it became so caustic that um, it was almost impossible for leadership to do anything. They would, they would say, look, this is what happened. This is why we're trying to do this. They couldn't lead. And uh, almost everything kind of turned into a crisis. So that church body is still going strong today, by the grace of God. But it was a long road to hoe because of all the misinformation that was going on, all the the lying. There are physical diseases that go the other way also. Uh, Have you heard of Hansen's disease? That's the the real name for leprosy. Uh, What is really leprosy? Lots of things were called leprosy in the Bible, but what we call leprosy today, uh, Hansen's disease, actually sees nerve cells as dangerous or as an infection and walls them off. And people burn themselves and don't know it. People get infections in their body and um, leads to all sorts of awful things in the body because uh, they're not getting the signals they need and, and things that should be treated go unnoticed. 
So there's the two sides. It's not enough to just silence the lies. We also have to speak the truth in love. We also have to be speaking into one another's lives and, and saying what needs to be said so that things don't go uh, unnoticed in a life. You know, you see somebody heading down a wrong road and you think, ah, it's not my business. I shouldn't, you know, I shouldn't speak into that young person's life or whatever. We're called to, to speak the truth in love and to be a body and to function properly. It has to happen. I think this next one uh, is more closely related than it might look at first glance. So he talks about not only silencing the lie, but speaking the truth in love. And then he says, in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry and do not give the devil a foothold. That sounds pretty serious, doesn't it? Um, In the context of human relationships, can we just say anger is inevitable? It's going to happen, right? You've lived long enough to know that. You're going to get angry. Anytime that you're living with other people, you're going to get angry. Sometimes I get angry living with myself. Um, it, it's just part of life. And I think that it's beautiful that, um, that the Bible says, it acknowledges that. You are going to be angry, but in your anger, do not sin. Uh, in the context, so in the context of human relations, it's going to happen. Uh, we'll misinterpret someone others, somebody else's actions, and hurt and disappointment quickly turn to anger. In fact, sometimes we don't even notice that it was hurt and disappointment. That that turns so quickly to anger, we didn't even notice that. Hey, what's really going on is I I feel hurt, I feel slighted, or whatever. Uh, now, in that, uh, another possibility is we understand exactly what the person meant to say to us or how the person treated us. We, we get it exactly. There's no way to, uh, you know, shade it or, or say, well, no, they didn't mean that. And again, hurt turns to anger. It's good in those situations if we can manage not to blow our top. Read Proverbs. There's all sorts of things in Proverbs about uh, a soft answer turns away wrath. A man who controls his temper temper is better than one who is able to take a city. (laughs) There's all sorts of stuff in there about, hey, just take a pause with your anger. Don't let it out uh, immediately. So that's good if we can um, manage not to blow our top. Manage not to respond in kind to the person who hurt us. That's good, but it's not good enough. It doesn't go all the way. In your anger, do not sin. So I can cut off the outward manifestation of anger, but proactively, Paul continues, don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. It's good if you've learned to control the outward uh, expression of anger, but if that anger is allowed to just smolder, unaddressed, you've had that, haven't you? It's going to flare up sooner or later. It's just smoking now, but sooner or later it's going to get oxygen and and people are going to go, where did that come from? Or it's going to burn you out. So, Let me give you a common scenario, one that Paul might have had in mind. Someone hurts me, I get angry, but in in a good sense, in a righteous sense, I've learned to control the outward expression of my anger. I don't uh, respond in kind, I I treat them with kindness, but uh, as good as that is, I go to bed still hurting. And I wake up the next morning and something triggers that memory. And I start to have a conversation with them in my head, even though I'm not, they're not there. And uh, it just starts to bubble up again. And uh, it keeps bubbling like a soup, of, a pot of soup that's covered with a lid on a low flame. But sooner or later, it starts to splash out in different places. Nothing huge, maybe just little comments. I'm always slanted slightly to the negative direction uh, in, my, in my view of the other person, 
just a little distorted. Maybe when I talk about them, just a little slanderous, you know, just a little edge of... Have you been there? Or am I the only wicked person in the room? Okay, thank you. I got a witness. So, the reason I ended with just a little slanderous is because that's actually in the verse. Some translations bring this across. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. Do not give the slanderer a place to dwell. Don't give the slanderer a foothold or a place to dwell. That's the word behind the devil. In the NIV, it just says, don't give the devil a a foothold. Behind the devil is the word diabolos. And uh, it might surprise you how that gets translated in some other places in the Bible. 1 Timothy 3.11, Paul is talking about the wife of a deacon and what she must be. And he says, she must not be a malicious talker. The word behind that is devil. She must not be a diabolos. The Greek word is diabolos. When he says that people in the last days will become slanderous, again, the word is diabolos. So, but the reason Ephesians translated as, as devil is because it has a definite article in front of it. It says the diabolos, talking about a, a person. The slanderer. And it's, it's a way, a common way in the Bible, of referring to Satan by one of his primary functions. A diabolos is one who falsely accuses and divides people. And that's, that's Satan's main goal in his twisted life is to accuse especially believers and to divide people. Jesus said to the Pharisees, uh, they, they said their father was Abraham and he said, no, <laughs> if your father was Abraham, you'd act like Abraham. You'd love God. You'd love me. It says, speaking of the devil, he was a murderer from the beginning. He says the Pharisees are actually children of their father, the devil, the diabolos. And then he says, he was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. You know, that's, this is a hard word, but let that sink in that there's this connection between the devil and his slander and lie and between when we speak slander, when we say things that are untrue of other people or maybe we don't know the truth of them and we still repeat them. This is serious business. Um, I can't imagine any Christian wanting to be uh, known as a diabolos. Uh, Who would want that family name? Who would want to unknowingly... uh, or knowingly set out to speak Satan's native tongue. But it can happen in the body of Christ when we don't righteously address our anger. When we return a kind word, but instead entertain um, and nurture an unkind thought, we can end up actually helping the devil with his job of accusing and destroying and dividing. Now, yes, Paul says when you're angry, control your response, but do something else. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. I wonder what advice. Have you heard that verse before, first of all? And I wonder what advice you've received based on that verse. My dad, when I was growing up, he was not overtly Christian. He didn't go to church with us or anything, but he was a wise man. He always told me, John, keep short accounts. Don't let stuff fester with your brother uh, you know, or your friends. That's good advice. Actually, it's godly advice. Uh, the Bible counsels quick resolution within the body and puts the responsibility on you. Whether you're the offended or the offender. I know that doesn't sound fair, but Jesus said, if you're offering your gift at the altar... And there, remember that your brother or sister has something against you. Leave your gift in front of the altar. First, go be reconciled to them. Then come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly. 
So God actually values right connection, even back then, God valued right connection between his people more highly than he did sacrifice, which he'd commanded. So that puts the responsibility, uh, if you know that someone has something against you, the responsibility is on you to go solve it. Um, But Christ also says, Matthew 18, if your brother or sister sins against you, go and point out their fault, just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. So in the body of Christ, we can't say, well, okay, I will when they do. No, he puts the responsibility for either the, if you're offended or the offender, it's on you to go make things right. This makes so much sense to me. I, I remember hearing people say, well, marriage is, a good marriage is 50-50. That does not work. Because nobody ever puts out 50%. So um, I'm putting out 30 and Sue's putting out 40 and those don't meet. A good marriage is 100%, 100%. We're both in it. We're both trying to love the other person and do what's best for the other person. We're not going to hit 100%. But 75 and 65 at least overlap. <laughs> they bring us together. And, and the same is true if we're all, if we're each responsible for making things right, even if we're the offended or the offender. That will get us together if we're all living that out. Or maybe one of us is when the other one isn't. But it will at least bring us together. Now here, you know, I mentioned what kind of advice did you receive about this verse? Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Does that mean every issue has to be dealt with? Face-to-face reconciliation before I can go to bed? What do you think? Okay, you're going to be awful tired. You're just going to be perpetually sleepless. I mean, even in marriage. And, and I'll just tell you, I had this view of I've got to so- settle everything with Sue before I go to bed. I just made the fight worse. We got tireder and tireder, more upset, more upset. You know, king-size bed with almost the whole bed between us <laughs> when we went to sleep. And, and somewhere along the line, uh, I got some wisdom on this that no, I don't have to settle everything with Sue before I go to bed, but I better settle it with God. And another thing I would do is, no matter how I felt, I would get close to Sue and give her a kiss and tell her I loved her before I went to bed. I would at least treat her with kindness (laughs) before I closed my eyes, but I had to get right with God before I went to bed. Um... Did you notice that do not let the sun go down on your anger is in quotes? That's very helpful when you notice that in the Bible because then you can look around and say, well, who is Paul quoting? Well, it happens to be he's quoting Psalm 4.4. And the interesting thing is that that psalm is not about what we do, it's about what God does. Psalm says nothing about face-to-face reconciliation. The psalm is totally about dependence on God. It opens with, Answer me when I call to you. And concludes with, I will lie down and sleep in peace for you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. And then right in the middle, it says, in your anger, do not sin. Second part of it's different. In your anger, do not sin. When you are on your beds, search your hearts and be silent. Offer right sacrifices and trust the Lord. So this is talking about when you're laying in bed, you're you're working things out with God before you go to sleep. And this was no small offense, evidently, that David had in mind because the, the Hebrew word that he uses for anger is trembling. When you're trembling on your bed. That's pretty upset. When you're laying there shaking, you're so upset. When you're angry on your bed, take it to God. Even when you're trembling with anger, settle things with God before you go to sleep. If you just glance down to the last uh, two verses of our text, 31 and 32, there's this whole list, and I'm not going to take time to unpack it. I'm thinking about making a video on this 
because I believe there's a, a progression of anger here. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as Christ in God, just as in Christ God forgave you. So there's that equation again. Root out and replace with. Uh, something that can happen just between, sometimes that can happen just between us and God. Um, search your heart. Be silent before God. He can bring clarity to the situation. Uh, you can get up the next day and, and de- determine to do the right thing, to make peace with the person as quickly as you can. But that might even go on for a while, right? Maybe you can't get together. Here's just another thing that has helped me. Stop the conversations in your head with other people. If you're having an angry conversation, you know, and you always win in your head, right? You always win. You're always brilliant. You cut them off at the knees. They're groveling, asking for forgiveness. It very seldom happens that way in real life. Just cut those as soon as you realize it's happening. If, that, if, if, if that's you, cut that conversation off. And how I do it is I say, I confess, God, that person is not here, but you are. You're the one that can hear my thoughts. By your Holy Spirit, will you please, and by your word, will you please get my mind right? And will you be working in their heart so that when we're together, we can actually get together? God has answered that prayer wonderfully many times. Forgive each other just as in Christ God forgave you. That's the equation. Uh, remembering what God has done for us and applying that to our relationships with other people. I'm not going to spend much time on this next one uh, except to point out how clearly it reveals a, a radical shift in our direction once we come to faith in Jesus Christ. He who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with his own hands that he may have something to share with those in need. That describes a complete 180. Totally doing away with one thing and replacing it with something much better. Stop doing one thing. Start doing the exact opposite. I'm hoping that most of us don't think of ourselves here as having been thieves. Maybe you were. Maybe Christ totally turned your life around. Praise God. But um, I'm going to put it in terms that I think we could all deal with. You used to look out for your own needs at at the expense of others. Stop that. And now at your own expense, care for the needs of others. That's a 180 that we can all do, right? Stop living self-centered lives. Start living other-centered lives. It's all over the New Testament. And it's a glorious change when you witness that in people's lives. When you witness that happening in the church, it's, it's magnificent. There's just no other way to describe it. When people witness it in the world, they'll, take up, uh, they'll set up and take notice. Okay, verse 29. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. It's literally, don't let any rotten words come out of your mouth. A lot of colloquial wisdom is really straight out of the Bible. We're losing this. But it used to be, I mean, even Thumper in Walt Disney's classic Bambi said, if you can't say something nice, don't say nothing at all. If, if we just put the first part in, of that verse into play, if we could just filter our words and kept worthless ones, hurtful ones, on the backside of our lips, can you imagine what just... Just that part of the equation. What would that do for our world? What would that do for your relationships in marriage or with your children or with your parents if you just kept hurtful thoughts on the backside of your lips? But when we stop there, it's only a fraction as good as it could be. (laughs) Maybe you've heard that acronym THINK in terms of how you speak. Have you heard that one? Uh, Each letter has T is for is it true? H, is it helpful? I, is it inspiring? N, is it necessary? K, is it kind? The implication is, 
run your thinking through some kind of filter. And if it's not one of those things, then don't say it. But God's Word goes further. It makes think proactive. Not just root out, but replace. What is supposed to come out of a Christian's mouth? Especially in uh, regard to their brothers and sisters in the body. Encouragement. That which is helpful for building others up according to their needs that it may benefit those who listen. There's actually two groups uh, being looked at there. It implies that you're sensitive, you're aware to uh, the needs, the, maybe the emotional hurts, the spiritual needs in other people's lives, and you strategically speak words to strengthen other people. And you do it not just with respect to the individual, but with respect to the body. Uh, it, it actually says, for the good of the whole body, uh, do this according to their needs, and that's singular, so according to one person's needs, that it may benefit those, plural, who listen. The idea, you know, you can, you can come into church in the morning. This, this body is called, it says, uh, we're a, a household being built to become a place where God lives by His Spirit. And you can come in, and in your speech, you can start pulling out the bricks with another person, but it might be spilling over onto others around you. So, uh, these attributes that we're supposed to root out and replace with grace among the listeners, um, that's a responsibility of each part of the body. It means we each have a share in how gracious this community is. So just a quick recap. It's not enough to silence the lie. We have to speak the truth in love. It's not enough to contain our anger. We have to deal with it. It's not enough to stop stealing. We must live uh, responsible, generous, other-oriented lives. It's not enough to silence destructive speech. We are responsible to build each other up. Now what happens if we don't root out and replace? What if we let grow and neglect? Verse 30, And do not grieve the Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. I, I already mentioned this verse. It's been a couple of months since we, we read it. Ephesians 2.22 In Christ, you are being built together to become a dwelling place in which God lives by His Spirit. God's Spirit dwells in a special way among His gathered people. And God's Spirit can be grieved when we fail to put these graces into play. He's saddened by it when it happens among us. And then our last verse says, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. So there's the model. There's where we get the power for this. We don't forgive each other because it's good for us. I mean, that's, that's a great benefit. We forgive because we're forgiven. We lay it down because Christ took it up. <laughs> it's not about a new set of rules. It's about a new relationship with each other because we have a new relationship with God. Amen? Amen. Well, let's pray. Father in heaven, that's a lot. <laughs> and I would say easier to say than easier to live. It just forces me back to you, to being regularly in your word, to be reminded of these truths, to be sensitive to the conviction of the Holy Spirit in my own life when I've offended or when I'm letting an offense grow in my own heart. So Father, we need your help to live this out. And we pray for your help, your divine help, to, to live this out in a way that a watching world will see. Uh, when worldly people, when people who don't know Christ see the church tearing itself apart, they go, yeah, that's just what I thought. It's a bunch of hypocrites. But when, we, when they see us loving each other through uh, warts and all, and when they see us patching things up and mending and, and keeping short accounts, 
That's attractive to people who don't know you. That's attractive to anybody who lives in this dog-eat-dog world. And so, Father, I pray that you would uh, enable us through the power of your Spirit, through the teaching of your Word, to become the church that we ought to be. In our private relationships with one another and with outsiders, but also in here. I pray for that power in my own life. And let all God's people say, Amen.